Hello everyone, thanks for coming. Today we're going to discuss different ways of making remote calls in distributed systems. Well, let's talk first what makes us qualified to even discuss this topic. I'm Mikita Pratsenko, I'm a practicing developer, I work at Roku, I work in billing and payments team. And in the past I worked on a bunch of different projects using both microservices and monolith approach and learning some stuff the hard way in the process. And today I'm going to talk how to avoid the common pitfalls in REST world. It's pretty easy, don't use REST and avoid those pitfalls. And I will tell you how you can, how, what you can use instead of REST and why. My name is Alex, I'm hands-on software engineer. I've been working on distributed systems for over a decade. I built system using REST, SOAP, and different RPC solutions. Currently I work for Google, where I started to use gRPC. And today I'm going to tell you why gRPC is one of the best options you have when it comes to remote calls. So let's start from the beginning. When people talk about REST, they use a lot of big words like hypermedia, self-descriptive resources, service-oriented architecture. But let's start with what REST is not. REST is not JSON over HTTP. Very often people get confused and they mix up HTTP APIs and REST APIs and even Roy Fielding, the author of the very concept of REST, is pissed off about this confusion. So let's unconfuse things. Let's learn how to tell HTTP APIs apart from REST APIs. If I try to describe REST in two words, these two words would be... Uh, outdated approach? No, architectural pattern. <laughs> Set of concepts and practices to make your system more scalable and your life easier. And the most important of these concepts is state transfer. It means that client has all the data about the current session. And if there is a need to change the state of the session, the client sends the set of the changes back to the server and the server is 100% stateless. Why is that important? Let's take a look at a couple of examples. On the left from you, we see an example of a good RESTful API. We have a resource with a unique identifier. Client can call it. It can get all the information about the resource. It can change the state of the resource and send the changes back to the server. This is easy to write. This is easy to maintain and easy to scale. And on the right side, we see an example of a non-RESTful API where the server has to remember the information about the current session. What, has been, what was found on page one? What is going to be found on page three? How to reconcile the changes if something pops up in the process? It smells of sticky connections. It smells of scalability issues, and it smells of weird bugs. There is no REST for the weekend. Okay, so we understood what REST is not. And believe me, gRPC is not REST either. So let's see what it is. Google started to adopt microservices a long time ago, probably even before this war was invented. And as you know, in microservice world, every client call results in 100 remote network calls. To make all this process communication, inter-process communication efficient, Google developed its own framework for remote procedure calls, or RPCs, and it was called, not, not gRPC, it was called Stabi. So Stabi was used inside Google for many, many years. There were m multiple generations of Stabi, and finally, in 2015, Google released open source version of Stabi, which is called gRPC. So gRPC, it's an RPC framework originally developed by Google. Today it's a part of Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It uses HTTP2 as a transfer protocol, and it's built with all the modern requirements to distributed systems in mind. And today, gRPC is used in Google and a number of other companies. Whoa, 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 you said... RPC, remote procedure calls, what does it mean back to the age of CORBA and RMI? Nice try, but no cigars. gRPC is neither CORBA nor RMI. Please remember that and never ever compare them. Because gRPC is built with all the lessons learned from years of using Stabi. Lessons in scalability, in performance, in building a tool which is easy to use and easy to maintain for a long time. We can even say that gRPC is not just a library. First of all, there is a set of best practices on how to build, how to design your distributed systems. And gRPC is built on top of these principles. It provides you default out-of-the-box implementations, 
for these abstractions, and it gives you extension points. Using these extension points, you can easily customize any part of its implementation. You can plug your, plug your customization. You can add new features. And gRPC Assistant today is not only Google. There are other companies and individual developers who contribute into gRPC Ecosystem. So what makes it even more popular that gRPC is not only Java. gRPC is available for at least 10 programming languages. What it gives you? It gives you freedom and flexibility. So your client and your server, they don't need to be written in the same language anymore. It's not RMI. And what else you can do? You can write a prototype of your service in Python and then rewrite it for production in Java, and your clients, clients of your service, they will not even notice this change. Well, but you're talking about implementations now, and let's take a step back and ask ourselves, can we even compare these two guys? Because REST is an architectural pattern, and gRPC is a library with a bunch of implementations. Yeah, good point, but again, gRPC is more than a library. It also imposes a set of principles it's built on, and it creates an ecosystem based on best practices. So both gRPC and REST are de facto tools to build distributed systems based on some principles. And they both are widely used in scalable systems, including microservices architecture. Let's recall how we usually taught to build our microservices. Pretty similar to drawing an owl. They tell us, take our framework, XYZ, now it's 5.0, and then, you know, just add your microservices. Yeah. But as Oscar Wilde said, truth is rarely true and never simple. Exactly. Because... With microservices, we solved one problem and acquired new ones. Because nothing is free. Let's name some, some of the new challenges we are facing right now. We have services that call other services, and the services come more and more and more. And as a result, we have this complex all hierarchy and huge amount of remote calls. First off, it's going to affect our performance, because all these network calls are expensive. But we got one more problem, even before we make this call. We need to find out whom to call, where to call, where to find the service, or, in other words, how to discover it. So service discovery is another question we have to answer now. And in real life, we usually have multiple instances of the same service, right? So at any given moment in time, we have to find what instance to call, depending on the load or something else. So load balancing is another problem we have to solve. And after we finally solved all this, and we made our calls, we get complex call hierarchy, and we need to trace it and monitor it. And when some of the services are slow, we need to be able to A, find them, and B, tolerate them. It's even worse than that, because services won't just be slow, they will break, they will crash and burn. Back in 1987, Leslie Lambert said that a distributed system is the system where your computer can break because of the computer you didn't even know about or something like that. 1987? Was it even before people started to use REST? Or about well, well, well kind of before that. <laughs> so now we are going to have services that are going to break. And we need to live with it. We need to teach ourselves how to build a system that can keep going on when some of the services are failing. All right, so we got a bunch of new challenges. Only a few of them we just mentioned. But we are lucky because gRPC is built with all these issues in mind and it helps us to approach them. Well, not just gRPC because REST got introduced back in 2000 and since then people learned how to deal with these challenges in the REST world as well. Did they? They did indeed. So let's take a look at example. And basically, let's go ahead and write the services we can call. What do your services do when people call them? They usually execute some logic and they call other services. So let's build an aggregating service to collect um, Pokemons, for example. Or big data? Oh, well, you cannot do anything without big data nowadays. So let's collect Pokemons and big data buzzwords and aggregate them. And to make things even funnier, let's don't forget that external sources may return us data or Pokemons or big data buzzwords using different formats. Some may reply with JSON, some with binary data, and some may even return XML. Sure, XML, because XML and REST are like two pieces in a pod, right? Uh, no, not really. On the contrary, REST doesn't care about format. Representation doesn't matter. 
You can use homing pigeons to transfer your data if you want to. And to illustrate your point, let's build our service to actually accept the data, different data formats from different sources, and aggregate it, and reply to a client with some kind of unified format. So let's start with, a, with some code snippets from a sample Spring Boot application to show how to build a RESTful architecture. As with a classical web application, we are going to have a controller that is going to get requests, provide replies. We are going to have the service to do all the heavy lifting. And we are going to have data sources to call external services to get the data. And let's not forget that REST is all about resources. These external services will reply us with, they provide us resources first and foremost. They will give us some unique identifiers of those resources. They will give us some structured data. And the representation of this data, JSON or XML, is irrelevant. We don't care. Why is that? Because when we actually do the call, we use REST template, get the data, and the serialization is going to happen under the hood because all modern frameworks can handle JSON, XML, binary serializations. It's not a problem. It's just as simple as to draw a circle instead of an owl. The fun part is going to happen in the service. The interface of the service is simple. We're just going to call it to fetch a new resource by ID, and under the hood is going to call external services, but it's also going to add value. And by this, I mean we need to provide a type back to the client because we need to be able to tell apart Pokemons from big data buzzwords. And also, we need to provide a client an, ex an next ID so the client will know how to find the next resource. And final step is controller, and it's pretty simple. Just call the service and define a URI, URI so we can find this, uh, this resource and define, last step with, that we need to do is to define a representation, JSON in our case. So we got a system that we can start integrating with. It's easy to integrate because all modern languages have production ready HTTP clients you can start integrating right away. And if you want to test it, you can use any tool starting with curl. Great, okay, controller support just are cool and easy. But let's look at the bigger picture. How your client will know where to find your service with your controller? Good question. Let's find out how to bring REST and service discovery together. Today, we have a bunch of service discovery solutions out there, starting with world-famous Apache Zookeeper. And the most popular solutions, they usually implement some kind of DNS-based service discovery, providing you a DNS record to resolve and pointing you at the right direction. So let's take a look how it's done in Kubernetes, for example. We have two services. One service is defining its own name, and another service is using this name as a host name in the URL. It's pretty simple. No code changes are needed. It just works. Yeah, but this is an external solution. Somebody has to install it. Somebody has to support it. It is true, but if you are deploying your services to cloud today, the chances are that your cloud provider already has some kind of solution ready for you. For example, Amazon has Route 53 and load balancers, elastic load balancers, and Google has Kubernetes. OK. So you showed your controllers, annotations, and podges. And they're easy to write, indeed. And we engineers, we like coding. We do. So we jump to writing our controllers right away. So what do we end up with? Oftentimes, we have a bunch of services, and nobody really knows their APIs. Makita, what is an API of your service? Sure, not problem. Let me check my laptop. Let me check my controller. Wait. I believe while I was on vacation, Peter has changed some something here. I have to look it up. So does it look familiar? And it worked when I had two or three APIs, but in microservice wars, we have like gazillion of APIs, and it would be good to formally describe them. Well, what stops us from using Swagger? We can use Swagger to formally describe an IDL, or we can go the opposite direction. We can parse our controllers and annotations and generate Swagger definition based on them. Well, some parts of your team can use it, some others cannot. It requires an additional discipline in your project. It requires an extra process. It requires an external tool, after all. With gRPC, we change the game. We start with an API. When we need to write a service that aggregates data from multiple sources, the very first thing we have to write is its formal definition, its API. 
There is no other way to start writing gRPC service. Out of the box, gRPC uses protobuf as a language to describe your APIs. You can change this implementation, you can use other IDL, but the default language is protobuf. With protobuf, we can easily define our aggregation service with no boilerplate code. We get a single method, get, it takes a request, it returns a response. In the request, we have an ID. In the response, we have ID, content, response type, and ID of the next item. Now, we formally described our service. And remember, I brought up a point that gRPC is built on top of best practice. So having formal API specification before coding is one of them. And we always have API of our service, no matter how many services we have. We have it described in language-neutral way, and all the clients will use it as a source of truth. Now, we should use gRPC runtime to generate classes from it. In Java, we can use gRPC Java runtime. You can do it from command line, or you can use your build systems. There are plugins available for Gradle, for Bazel, for Maven. Let's call our wizard gRPC Java runtime, hush, and we generate abstract service class. Push and we generate requests and response with, with builders. Podgers? We don't need no stinking podgers. But the client has to generate the builders now somehow. Of course, but it's easier than writing them manually. And it will be just an extra step in your build process. And we, of course, can generate strongly typed client libraries or stops. Now it's time to implement gRPC service. We have to, to extend generated abstract class, and it already has an RPC method get. It's the same method as we described in our IDL. It takes a request, but it doesn't return anything, as you can see. Why? Because gRPC API is a synchronous by default. Here is the scene. When we receive a request, we don't always have a response right away. Oftentimes, we have to calculate it, we have to query it from some external service, or we have to build it from multiple sources. What we can do here? We can just block our current thread until we have all the data available and then return it to our client. This way we could have response as, an, as a re return type of our method. But what happens when we block the current thread per request? Let's take a look at an example. We have a service with a thread pool of size x and it blocks current thread per request. First request takes the first thread, second take another, and so on. And request x takes the last thread. And when x plus 1 request arrives, and we have no threads left, we just reject this call. So number of requests we can handle at any given moment in time is limited by the number of threads we have in our thread pool. This approach kind of works, but it, it doesn't really scale. That's why we use Stream Observer. And Stream Observer is one of the key interfaces in gRPC. It has method on next. And when we want to send a response to our client, we can call this method on next with a response. When our RPC method is called, we don't block a thread. And we don't return anything to our client. Now we can handle more requests than we have threads in our thread pool. And when we have a result, we just call on next method passing our result to a client. This approach is always called Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we will call you. When the result for a client is ready, we will call this client using this provided method on next. We call first, we call third, we call x, depending on what response is ready. That's why API is looking like that. Now our server can handle large number of requests. But if we have result right away, we can immediately give it back to our client, just don't block the thread. We can use aggregation response builder to build our response and send it back to our client using method on next. Wait a second, I remember you defining a field called nextID in your protobuf file, but I don't see you using it here. Sure, yeah, I don't use it here, because the reason, the reason is simple, I don't have it. I'm talking about the stream of Pokemons, and as a father of two, I can tell you that there are much more Pokemons that you can imagine. When I get a Pokemon, I have no idea what will be the next when I have no ID to provide. But how your client will know how and where to find the next item? Let's see. I need next ID so my client can pass it back to me in the next request, right? So if I don't have it in my request, I don't need it in my response. So I just want my client to subscribe, to subscribe to my stream of Pokemon, and when I have something to give them, I'll return them a new item. That's a typical streaming scenario. 
While streaming, there are no resource IDs, there is a stream of responses, and server knows better when to send them back. In gRPC, we can just add stream modifier to the response, and voila, we have streaming API. Now we can set multiple Pokemons back as needed. Let's name our method subscribe now and remove IDs from request and response. And now we have clean server streaming API. That was an aggregation service definition. But it takes this data from other services. It gets it from content service. Let's describe this content service. Content service is even simpler. It has nothing in the request and it has ID and content in the response. We are going to have a separate service for Pokemon and separate service for big data, but both of them are described using the same API definition. And using this API definition, we call our wizard cat, meaning gRPC runtime, and it will generate service definitions and clients for us. And aggregation service will just call our content service using these clients or stops. Let's implement aggregation service to see how we A, implement streaming gRPC service, and B, how we use client libraries or client stops. Here comes the example. We take generated content stops, we inject them, and when client calls the subscribe method, we get the request here. What we are doing here, we are doing a find out, meaning we call all the content services. By the way, we are using the same Hollywood principle. We don't block the current thread when we call our services. So this way we can subscribe to multiple sources from a single thread. When we call a client stop, it's like, it's like a voicemail. We kind of ask our service, please send us back a Pokemon when you have it. And here's my number, meaning my stream observer with my own next method on it. And when service has a new Pokemon, it calls me back using my method on next, giving me back my new item. Few things for emphasize, to emphasize here. With, first of all, with Hollywood principle, we could subscribe to several services from single thread. Other than that, with streaming, we can get multiple responses back because there are a lot of Pokemon out there, so all next method will be called many, many times. And finally, please note that after we added streaming to our API, our method hasn't changed at all because gRPC APIs are designed to be non-blocking and reactive. Being asynchronous is important for scalability, so gRPC forces you to write in this style and forces you not to block the current thread. And all the work we will do in a, when message arrives in on next method, let's look at it. Here, when we get a new Pokemon or big data buzzword, we convert it, we add a response type, and we build our aggregation response builder using our aggregation response, sorry, using a builder. And that's it. No resources, no next IDs. So what do we did? Here is an aggregation service. When client subscribes to it, it subscribes to all the sources. When any of the sources return a result, we convert and return it back to our client. When other service responded, we return other Pokemon to our client, and so on. So to launch everything we wrote, we need to start our gRPC server now. Any ideas how we do that? With annotations, maybe? Uh, almost, but no, with builders. We have a native server builder, we set up a port, and we add our service. If our gRPC server implements multiple APIs, which is usually the case, we can call add service multiple times. And that's everything we need to start our service, but you see that we injected Pokemon and Big Data client to our aggregation service. Now let's see how we created these clients. We have native builders to instantiate them. This time it's native channel builder. With native channel builder for others, host port, we created a channel. And channel in gRPC is a logical abstraction, logical connection between your client and your service. Using channel, we can create clients or stops. We don't need to write the stops libraries manually anymore. Using method new stop, we create an asynchronous stop. We already saw how to use this stop. It takes a request and stream observer of the responses. But if you need to block your current thread until you get a response, you can use a blocking client. And finally, if you have hate callbacks and you love functional style, you can use future-based clients. You can call new future stop method and it will give you back your future. Give our future back. Sorry, just trying to wake you up, guys.
Okay. And, and now you can map your future, you can subscribe to it, and so on. Choose whatever stub you need. One doesn't simply choose a gRPC client. Actually, one does. In most cases, you will only need one of them. Wow, that's a lot to digest, but still, that's uh, beginning. Let's talk about something more interesting than stubs and builders. You asked me about server discovery and REST, and now I want to ask you about server discovery in gRPC world. Sure, first of all, nothing stops us from using DNS-based solution like you did, and here we did exactly that. But gRPC provides you extension points in, in case you have your own solution for service discovery or load balancing. Maybe you have some custom metrics that like, let you choose which instance to call. So in this case, you don't have host and port, but you implement two interfaces instead. Name resolver is the first one. It's an implementation of your service discovery. And load balancer is your load balancing strategy. gRPC provides you some simple implementations out of the box, but you can write your own if you need. And your implementation can integrate with your own homegrown, I don't know, load balancing solution or with client-side load balancing or anything else. So gRPC doesn't limit you by using external DNS-based service discovery solutions. Another notable thing here is Netty. Standard gRPC implementation is built on Netty, and Netty provides us, us an asynchronous and unblocking I.O. And HTTP2 used by Netty with protobuf used by gRPC give us high-performance framework. And performance, performance is a first-class citizen in gRPC. gRPC team continuously running performance benchmarks. If you follow a link on the slide, you can find real-time performance dashboards for the latest available release and for the latest development version and master. These benchmarks are run for every single pull request. It helps gRPC team to find any performance regressions as soon as possible. And we, gRPC users, always know what throughput and latency we can achieve using gRPC. As you can see, for the scenario under test with gRPC Java, we can achieve more than 600,000 QPS on 8-core machines, or even more than 2 million QPS if you use 32-core machines. Okay, that's even faster than the last time we talked about it. And that's cool. You totally got me convinced non-blocking I.O. is the way to go. But REST can do non-blocking I.O. too. Asynchronous servlets have been around for a while. And B, you were talking about performance of streaming solutions between servers. But what about clients? Because real system is going to have a client and a server. And what if we have performance issues between a client and a server? What if we have a client in Australia complaining about 900 millisecond latency? In REST world, that can be easy to fix. You can just drop in a cache between your client and your server. Modern CDN providers let you do it for mere cents for a gigabyte of traffic. And you need no con changes and no infrastructure changes on the server side. Okay, in this case, we can use gRPC for server-to-server -server performance and provide client RESTful APIs that can be cached. Well, I agree. That's a totally valid approach, but you can use REST in the backend world as well. For example, REST is an ideal candidate for serverless solutions. Like, how do you do a classical deployment in cloud? You usually have a couple of VMs, you have a load balancer. If you need to scale, you just add more VMs when you don't need them anymore, you shut them down, you stop paying for that. But what if you're not Google? What even? What if these two VMs are not used 100% 24 by 7? It means you're paying for something you're not using. To solve this issue, serverless was invented. In the serverless approach, your code is represented as a function that takes an input and it does something and you pay only while your code is being executed and your function can be shut down immediately after it's done. And REST being stateless is an ideal fit for a, for a stateless function. Okay, so um, yes, we saw that use cases are kind of different. Let's take a breath and see what we've got here. The difference between gRPC and REST is visible with a naked eye. Yes, but it didn't stop us from implementing our aggregators using both REST and gRPC. And I'm not talking about a few code snippets on slides. We actually wrote the code, we committed and pushed it to GitHub, and we compiled it and deployed it to cloud. 
And Alex started with asynchronous streaming in his gRPC services. I use client polling for REST. Alex wrote, started with writing IDL for his gRPC stuff. I wrote some controllers and annotations. Does it, does it even work? Huh, let's give it a try then. Okay, so other than services, we even have a UI, and we will show you. I'll try to show it to you. Yeah, we got all the Pokemons, we got all the big data buzzwords. Not all of them, but maybe. It's hard to track. Some of them. So, is it Pokemon? Well, Tototech sounds like a Pokemon. Okay, if I click on it, I get new one. Ever, uh, that's definitely big data stuff. Storm. <laughs> about, yeah. Sure. Beaker. Um, not sure. Probably My Pokemon. son would know. Yeah, your son would definitely know. Um, it seems like we have, we have some confusion here. We cannot really tell them apart for sure. I believe it would be nice to be able to guess to vote and see if you have guessed right. But to do this, we we'll, we will need to change our architecture. We'll have to add a couple of components, starting with with voting service, so we can accept a vote and. We can compare if you guess correctly if it's a Pokemon or big data buzzword. And to do this, we need to go to aggregator and compare the actual type with the type provided in the vote. And it's also going to validate the item to make sure that it actually exists because we don't need no fake news here. And we don't need election meddling either. So voting service will pass the vote to the new service called leaderboard, which will keep track of top five guessers. And it will give them back to our client or our gateway. And gateway service will randomly choose between gRPC and REST implementation and provide public API to our clients. That's how new architecture looks like. But with the new architecture, we got all the problems we talked about earlier. Leaderboard seems to be an obvious bottleneck. If leaderboard starts failing... When leaderboard starts failing... When leaderboard starts failing, voting and gateway and clients are going to fail too. We have a classical, typical cascading failure scenario. In REST world, people usually handle this kind of issues using circuit breakers like Hysteric. If the server starts failing, we just stop calling it, but we do a health check every now and then, and while it's down, we produce an error or fallback response right away. We don't call the service. We give it a chance to recover. And when our check passes, we just resume the normal traffic. Okay. Circuit Breaker is a great pattern, I agree. And you can use it in gRPC. It will require you to write some more code to integrate it with Hystrix, for example. But we have another problem here. The war doesn't end up with dead services. It's even worse to have slow services. Slow services are harder to investigate, they kind of work, but something went wrong, you see. And circuit breakers are triggered by exceptions, including timeout exceptions, and our client are different as well. Some clients are latency sensitive, some others can wait. For example, what if a mobile client has 200 milliseconds timeout, but a laptop can wait for two seconds? If we set large timeout between our services, latency tolerate latency sensitive client sorry will fail. If client timeout is 200 milliseconds and first call took 50 milliseconds, second took 400 milliseconds, client got an error. But services they're not aware of that. They keep chaining along. They waste our resources. This doesn't work too well, does it? Let's see what happened with this short service-to-service -service timeout. Let's say 100 milliseconds timeout. What happens with latency-tolerant clients? If our client has two-second timeout and first hop took 50 milliseconds, second 400 milliseconds, and this moment we reached our 100 millisecond timeout between our services, service produced an error. And now we have to return error to our client. Probably it will be timeout error, even though our client was willing to wait for more than a second. So it doesn't work too well either. To fight such issues, gRPC introduces a concept of deadline propagation. What is that? When client timeout is 200 milliseconds and first call took same 50 milliseconds, what should be timeout for the next call? 200 minus 50 
gRPC does the math and it will automatically apply timeout of 150 milliseconds to the next call. If voting service is ready to call our leaderboard service in another 400 milliseconds, what should be a timeout for this new call? Again, gRPC calculates it for us 200 minus 50 minus 400. We have no time left. At this point, gRPC will cancel all the calls for this request with deadline exceeded status code and it will not even try to make a call to a leaderboard service. If you have latency tolerant client, everything will work for them even when services are slow. With gRPC, you get deadline propagation out of the box. It automatically adjusts timeout for every next request based on time already spent, and it will save our resources. Okay, we solved this problem, but we got a new one here. A client got an error, but how do we know which service is responsible for this error? Because the call went through a bunch of services. Client called Gateway, it called Voting, it called Aggregator, it called Leaderboard. How do we find the culprit? How do we get the logs? How do we investigate the problem? And how do we fix the issue after all? Uh, we can use distributed tracing solution. For example, projects up, uh, under Open Tracing or world famous Zipkin. Zipkin sprinkles a pinch of fairy dust over our projects and voila, we see all the, all, the, all the calls, all the calls for our request and we can see latency for each stage and we can see what services was, were called. So what is the trick? Under the hood, the hood we have added a label to each request of each service. We report to Zipkin each time we send or receive a request. We tell it who made the call, who received it, how long did it take, and so on. Does it sound complicated? Don't worry, gRPC already did the hard work for you. All you need is just to add interceptors when you create a server and a client. Those interceptors are already written for you. You can find them in OpenZipkin project. You create a tracer, you tell it where you find to find your Zipkin instance, and with tracer you can create these interceptors. So these interceptors are an example of gRPC ecosystem. In REST world, it's even easier. You don't have to instrument every call either, but all you need to do is to add a couple of dependencies here to your project and provide a property point in your application to a Zipkin saying, okay, it listens on this port, on this host, and that's it. You got all your latencies of all your calls for both of the implementations. Okay, so we, we have our microservice mesh which collects Pokemon, can tell Pokemon apart from big data and send result to a client. We can vote, we can calculate top five guessers, we have some fault tolerance built in, and we even have a tracing and monitoring. Who wants to try it out and test your Pokemon knowledge? Get your smartphones ready, we're gonna tell you what to do next. Okay, Alex is going to open up an application. Okay. So we have our, well, probably Pokemon here, but now you have buttons, right? You can try, say, is it, a is it a Pokemon or is it a big data? By pressing the corresponding button, Pokemon, big data. And also please note that on top of the screen, you have your username. We are going to have a contest, a competition. So we need to know who's the top guesser, who's the Pokemon expertise, so don't close your application. Leave it or take a screenshot so we can know that you is really you. So let me try to actually vote and let's check our leaderboard. Okay, and we have a leaderboard here. Did you, did you really vote? Yes, I did. Okay, oh, okay. okay. We, we got some, some requests coming in, so I'm trying. Okay, I'm so the top guessers will get prizes. We have the latest hardware from Google. And Roku, so try your smart, uh, get your smartphones, get your laptops. Alex is going to give you a link, oh, which you can link. load. Sure. <laughs> because we don't want to compete between ourselves, right? We already have this stuff. And the link is, guess it? Of course, grpc versus res.com. grpc versus res.com. You see it on the screen. Go there. Let's give a conference Wi-Fi a stress test. And our services as well. And our services as well. Let's see how well they can handle it. So, when while people are voting, let's check our leaderboard. Leaderboard? Leaderboard. 
Okay, yeah, oh, I wow, saw. Oh, wow, <laughs> we have a pretty intense competition. Cool, guys, keep it on, keep it on. Okay, now we can take a look under the hood, right? So, we. Oh, okay, reload. Nice. Yes. So what you can see here is we deployed our services to one of the public cloud providers, and you see. This is a tracing. What you can see on the screen is a distribution of all the traces. You see? Well, and if we, we click, if we click on the trace, we see all the requests are coming in. What so, services it, they? Yeah. So that's a content. Let's check a what. What is more interesting? What? Okay. We can filter it, right? By mm -hmm. gateway. What? Just, just click on it. I can, I can see it here. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. So all right. you see all the steps, gateway, gateway, REST voting, REST voting, REST aggregator, REST big data content, and finally leaderboard. You see all the services that re your request. And we see a bunch of requests coming and the latency distributions here on the top. All right, so to make it even more interesting, what about breaking our system? What about breaking our leaderboard? Yeah, because we have fault tolerance and how do we test fault tolerance without breaking our system? Makita has a magic command that introduces a latency. To our system. Yeah, it adds like 750 millisecond latency to leaderboard. So three, two, one. I just broke leaderboard. All right. So, what? Let's check if our application still works. First of all, is it Pokemon Big Data? Yeah. Well, is it Pokemon or Big Data? Uh, it's a Big Data, of course. Mahut, Apache Mahut. Sure. Impala is Big Data as well. Okay. So, uh, our application still works. We still can what? But let's take a look. Oh, nice. The distribution looks better now. You see that our requests, took, they take longer now, much longer. But if we click to some of okay, the services... Okay, li li leave it because it's a REST implementation and you can see that we have gateway here, colon REST voting service, colon REST aggregator, but we don't call leaderboard because we have our circuit breaker open because it was triggered by exception. Nice, so your circuit breaker works, right? So Yes, uh, it does. Of course it's REST implementation, I filter out REST implementations. So to see if gRPC works, still works, we can click right here. And what you see here, I actually set a deadline 500 milliseconds to every word. So, and we can see here that no matter how long did it actually take, every individual request took, the entire call was canceled after around 500, 500 milliseconds plus some network latency. And we can see on the like, bottom right of the screen that it was canceled with deadline exceeded status code. So let's fix Yeah, lo lovely Kemi and Kikas PAP are leading the, uh, the competition. And I guess since our leaderboard is kind of broken, it's time to call it a day and announce our, our winners. So lovely Kemi and Kikas PAP, please raise your hands. Raise your hands. Okay. Oh, One nice. hand. Please come after the talk. Okay, so. please come after the talk to claim your prize and please don't close your application so we can f realize that it's really you. And thanks for participating. It, it was really fun to see our system working. <laughs> okay, the code of our demo, and that's about a dozen of different services, can be found on GitHub here using this link. And when slides are published, we are going to uh, make all the links available. You can just download them and learn more about gRPC and REST using those links as well. And we'd also like to thank this guy without whom the demo wouldn't be even possible because he wrote the UI for all our services. Thanks, Evgen. Thank you, Evgen. And on slides and demo, we thought that gRPC is the best fit if you need streaming and performance. But REST is very good when it comes to resource management and it's really simple to use. Both solutions can handle most common issues of microservice architecture. And you can even use them together like we did in this demo. And what are we trying to say here, actually? One simple thing. There is much, there is much more Pokemons than big data. It, it is true. It is definitely true. And you may have gotten an impression that the architecture you choose, the tool you choose, gRPC or REST, actually defines your application architecture. But that's not true. Both tools, REST and gRPC, can solve the common problems. The difference is the amount of effort and resources you have to spend 
to solve a specific use case. So start with your use case. Start with your problem. Sure, because after all, you can use a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but a nutcracker might do a better job. And we hope after this talk you have some idea which nut might require a sledgehammer. If you have any questions, we still have a few minutes to answer them, and after the talk you can find us and we will answer. Yes, and ask more questions or claim your prizes. Don't forget that. <laughs>